and welcome to this Lowy Institute virtual event. My name is Roland Rajar and I am the lead economist here at the Lowy Institute and host for today's session. Before we begin, as we are based in Sydney, let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet virtually today and pay my respect to their elders past and present. The topic for our conversation today is, does, does Southeast Asia need a new development model? Today's discussion follows an online debate published by the Lowy Institute focused on the same question, in which we asked six of Southeast Asia's best and most interesting economic thinkers to contribute their thoughts on the future of the region. That publication is available on our website. For today, I'm glad to say I'm joined by several of those con contributing writers to continue the conversation. First is Dr. Tricia Yeo, who is CEO of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, an independent public policy think tank in Malaysia, where she has previously held the positions of Chief Operating Officer and Fellow. Second, we have Vasuki Shastri, who is an associate fellow at Chatham House in London and has previously worked for Standard Chartered Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and as a journalist in India, Singapore, and Indonesia. He is also a best-selling author. His latest book published in 2021 is entitled, Has Asia Lost It? Dynamic Past, Turbulent Future. And finally, we have Tiza Mafira, who is the director of the Indonesia Office of Climate Policy Initiative, where she leads a team of analysts studying climate finance effectiveness and innovations for policymakers. She is also the executive director of the Indonesia Plastic Bag Diet Movement, a community-based organization which advocates for policies and awareness to reduce single-use plastics, and which, which has seen her named as one of five global ocean heroes in 2018 by the United Nations. So Tiza, Vasuki, Trisha, welcome to the Lowy Institute. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. So the topic uh, for our conversation today is obviously this question around uh, does Southeast Asia need a new development model? Now, many people might say that, well, the Southeast Asia doesn't have a new development model. Obviously, you know, one can take uh, that position. But what we're looking for is to try and understand, you know, where has Southeast Asia come from and, and where is it headed and, and what are the challenges that it faces? So just to, to kick us off on this uh, conversation, I might, might ask all of you, just if you can tell us, how do you understand, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of what has been Southeast Asia's development model and approach to development uh, to date? What, have, what has been good in the past and right now, what's, what do you see as uh, under challenge? Maybe if we can start with you, uh, Basuki. It's great to be here, Roland. I guess if you look at globalization, the tides of globalization, Southeast Asia has been probably the single largest beneficiary. Uh, and of course, a lot of people will say it looms very large in the way it has benefited from trade and investment. But China is also a continent-sized economy. And, and trade has never been more than 20, 25% of GDP, uh, compared with many countries in Southeast Asia, you know, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia come to mind, where trade has been the dominant uh, driver of economic growth. Inward investment uh, has been also a central feature in, in, in how these economies are organized. So the, the critical question is, uh, you've had four or five decades of very strong economic growth uh, because of these favorable tides. What happens when these tides reverse? And there's some evidence, uh, uh, you know, geopolitical as well as economic, uh, that globalization, the kind of globalization wave that we've seen over the past few decades uh, may well reverse. And this leaves an open question. Since South, can Southeast Asia rebalance its economic growth away from trade and investment into finding domestic drivers of growth? And there are some countries, I think, who are already well there. You know, Indonesia, I think, is a great example uh, where it, consumption has been a driver of growth uh, for the last two decades. Uh, but many other countries need to catch up. So uh, it's very difficult to come up with a one-size-all uh, prescription. So if you look at the more open economies, I would say you know Vietnam, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and, and Thailand, they probably fall into the category of you, know, you need to find domestic drivers of growth. Arguably, Singapore is going to be much more difficult uh, given the size of its economy. I would say Indonesia and Philippines are much better positioned from a domestic driver perspective, but probably need to do more in driving investment and trade. So you've got this mixed bag of challenges uh, uh, and, and, and from the commentary that one reads from uh, policymakers, they are seized uh, that this needs to change. I guess the complexity is in execution. 
Mm, thank, uh, thank you, Basuki. Um, Tricia, would you like to give your own views on, 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 this, on this question? Basuki is, is zeroed in on the globalization, deglobalization debate. Uh, what would you say? Sure. Uh, so firstly, thank you to the Lowy Institute for inviting me and uh, my colleagues here uh, both to contribute to the written piece as well as this forum today. So I think at the outset, before we even start talking about Southeast Asia as a region, uh, a very important region, especially given you know, the global trends of today, uh, what is really important to point out is um, that Southeast Asia really cannot be seen with a homogeneous lens or through a homogeneous lens, uh, simply because as Vasuki alluded to earlier, each of our economies is exclusively drawn from a very different kind of history um, with different backgrounds, uh, colonial backgrounds, constitutional backgrounds. And I think the economies themselves have taken various trajectories as well based on their own specific demographic makeups. Um, so with that out of the way, I think we can still categorize some of our Southeast Asian economies into uh, several different. So for example, one cannot compare uh, Singapore's progress, for example, with that of Malaysia. Um, and of course you have Vietnam and uh, Thailand who have taken on uh, a different route and um, Laos and Myanmar still sort of lagging behind. So that's just to start off with. Um, so I think the question that you asked was Southeast Asia's development model, what approach has it taken and what are its strengths and weaknesses? So one thing that um, I pointed out in my written piece for Lowy was that many of the countries adopted this sort of industrialist, industrialized model uh, that approach uh, taking, for example, a leaf out of the uh, East Asian economies. Um, in Malaysia, for example, which is the country that I am from and know best, the Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad then even had a look East policy, uh, looking at the examples of Japan and Korea. Um, so very export driven, um, you know, we rode the wave of rapid industrialization, getting into manufacturing and also um, looking at some of our earlier commodities such as rubber and palm oil. So the strengths was that especially throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, I think many of the Southeast Asian economies um, were very aggressive. We were driving forward in this industrialized, uh, industrialist approach, um, export driven. Um, and there are strengths to this model uh, simply because you know, we had, and we continue to, to do have a very strong um, workforce, for example, you know, labor is relatively cheap in the region, although that is changing. Um, and this applied well for a while until, of course, several of these financial um, crises struck. So I think I'll talk straight away about some of the weaknesses that we have seen in this development model that we've taken. Um, so one of the weaknesses that I have also highlighted in the piece is that um, this rapid industrialization did not actually match with the sort of um, governance approach that perhaps some of the more developed countries were able to do in their earlier days of rapid industrialization. And these governance structures are actually starting to emerge, the weaknesses and perhaps um, the lack of a stable institutionalized approach that emerged very much so from the pandemic period over the last uh, few years. Um, and although we are emerging out of that pandemic, I think many of our economies in Southeast Asia are still grappling with these structural weaknesses. And we can talk a little bit more about what these weaknesses are and what uh, we can do to improve them. But I think just contrasting between the aggressive industrialized approach versus uh, the kind of lack of governance that perhaps the, government, the governments of Southeast Asia um, were not able to emphasize or fully capitalize and optimize on in order to take the next growth truly forward. So I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Mm, yeah, it's kind of just a position between sort of hard economic development, which has been very strong, versus a lack of soft institutional development uh, to go with it, I think is where you're, you're zeroing, on, zeroing uh, in on. 
Um, now, the, you've talked a lot about industrialization. That's been this big part of the secret to Southeast Asia's, Asia's success. It's also come with a lot of costs in terms of the impact uh, on the environment. And I think this is something that uh, Teaser now to bring you in, have, you know, you've really uh, focused on in your work, but also uh, in the piece you wrote for us. So can you tell us uh, your views on, on this question of Southeast Asia's sort of model to the extent there is one, but more importantly, how it needs to change? Yeah, thanks, Roland. Um, well, I'll start with the strengths of um, ASEAN countries. And I think my colleagues have alluded to this as well that uh, we have enjoyed a growth, uh, relatively stable growth of around 5% per year. Um, this was before COVID-19, uh, that changed a little bit, but we're bouncing back. Um, but I do think that um, there is something that hasn't been achieved with all that growth. Um, and that is equality, uh, because across Indonesia, Laos, uh, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, there is a rise or, or at least persistent uh, inequality. And that you know, has shown itself uh, in more exaggerated form during the pandemic, where death tolls for the poor are higher than for wealthier citizens. And for example, uh, children with no internet access um, have suffered from lack of remote schooling. And this has happened across Southeast Asia. So I think that the development model for ASEAN in the past has been more focused on trying to industrialize, you know, looking at Western uh, countries as a model, as a champion. Um, but today we're, all, we're already seeing the significant decline of Western industrialization models, actually. Um, we're already seeing in the US, uh, in the UK, across Europe, wealth gaps, social gaps, and a, and a decline of overall well-being, which is pretty stark. So I don't think that that is because of a an accident. I don't think that's because of a political or a governance failure because governance in the Western uh, societies are, are pretty good. <laughs> I think it is a failure of the economic system because of that very focus on industrialized, large scale production uh, and growth of consumption. So I think, you know, wh whether we like it or not, we have now come into an era where climate change is here and affecting us uh, and affecting our economy. And we've also come to the realization that economic growth is limited, whether we like it or not, by the health of the ecosystems that provide us with uh, balanced weather, with clean water, with clean air and other essentials for human existence. So, so I think the climate crisis really now prompts um, ASEAN to contemplate the limits to growth, the limits to industrialization. Um, and if we agree that, you know, if, if growth is supposed to, supposed to support our common welfare and if it's not doing that, we should ask why. Um, and as I argue in my article for Lowy, what we should be focusing instead of industrialization models is to develop a resilient economy. And I argue that a resilient economy is an economy that doesn't rely on linear industrialization, but more, uh, it it is a it is a very big transformation towards a circular economy uh, model. I might um, just um, ask. I might just ask you to expand a little bit, though, because I think it's very interesting that I think um, certainly you and others from the region have certainly put climate change up there as an issue uh, that Southeast Asian nations need to deal with now, not not in the future. Um, it's a it's an issue to deal with uh, today. Governments, you know, the, the real world progress maybe is not that fast, but at least there are some that, you know, committing to net zero, putting target dates down, trying to roll out renewable energy um, emissions trading schemes and these sorts of of um, of things. But it's interesting because the typically this is posed as a tension, a tension between dealing with climate change and decarbonizing economies and reducing emissions per capita a tension between that agenda and the development and the economic growth and development agenda. These are still countries which are not at rich country per capita income levels, and so they should be allowed to pollute and transition at a much slower sort of pace. Now, how do you, you know, respond to that? I mean, you're, I think, suggesting a different paradigm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly because the focus is still on industrialization, that's why we have that tension. That's why um, dealing with the climate crisis has been framed as 
what can we do that doesn't sacrifice the economy? Whereas the framing should be whatever we do that sacrifices the environment will sacrifice the economy. So there's no way to work around this. Um, and, um, you know, it's apparent in some, you know, models where, uh, for example, in Indonesia, which I know best, um, the latest um, climate policy is to um, produce nickel, uh, to produce uh, car batteries. And because of that, um, Indonesia has issued 270 eight um, nickel mining uh, licenses uh, in, in, in the past two years alone. Um, so that is heading towards a new problem, right? A new environmental problem. Whereas what could have happened from the outset is if they designed it as a circular economy model, then they would have realized that we don't actually have to produce as much, extract as much nickel um, if we design it to be uh, recyclable uh, infinitely, right? Um, and that's by design, that has to be from the, the outset. It can't be an afterthought after 10 years of mining. So, I, I, you know, the resilient economies of the future will be those that don't rely on linear industrial models. Whatever the sector, whatever the commodity, it cannot be linear because those models, they deplete resources, they generate pollution and emissions. They do not factor external costs into their prices. Whereas a circular economy will mean that instead of using new materials, most of the things we produce should be recycled or should use recycled material, can be regenerated, can be repaired, can be reused, and it is all powered by renewable energy. Very little is extracted from the ground, very little will be disposed during production processes or at the end of a product's life cycle. And all of that will be apparent in the cost of a product as well. So all external costs will be factored into the price. I think then we'll see a very core transformation of the economy uh, and not just surface level uh, changes. Thank you. Thank you for that, Teza. That's, that's very well put. I think Teza, um, sorry, not Teza, uh, Trisha, did you have a, a comment on or to comment on this question? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think that many of these things actually are coming together. So there's an increased pressure, I think, on businesses worldwide um, to eventually comply with ESG standards, right? So the environmental social governance aspect of businesses. Um, in fact, I'm also involved right now in a project where we're looking at a national action plan on business and human rights in Malaysia. So again, in Southeast Asia, um, very little has been done in creating or coming up with regulations and standards as to what businesses need to do better to comply with human rights, with the human rights agenda. Um, I think linking human rights um, to the language of human rights, to the language of what traditional activists have done in the areas of environment, in the areas of labor and, and the social agenda, as well as in governance, I think this is still a weakness and we are trying to, to you know, just narrow that gap as we speak um, today. Uh, but I also just wanted to emphasize that, you know, we don't necessarily have to think of, of governance and environment in separate circles. I think they can be mutually reinforcing um, in the sense that without governance, you know, companies and countries themselves will not be able to create the right environment within which they can introduce better environmental standards um, across the board. So whether it's financial institutions, a large MNCs, uh, I think the pressures, of course, are highest on the small SMEs, right? The small businesses, um, whether or not they are able to emerge with the right human resources, uh, the right uh, kinds of employees who understand these international standards that are being placed on them, especially from the import market. So I think these are new trends that we need to take into account. Um, definitely, you know, climate crisis is there. But I also wanted to emphasize that, you know, we also need to look at our own Southeast Asian economies ourselves, the kinds of development projects that we are undertaking. Uh, some countries looking at dams, for instance, which are uh, certainly damaging on the environment as well as on the communities that are affected um, and whether or not there is capacity amongst our Southeast, Southeast Asian governments themselves um, to be able to understand what it takes to undertake these large public infrastructure projects. So again, I think that tension still exists between we want to have development for our people, we want to build bridges, we want to build, uh, we want to build 
for our nations. But how do we do that, you know, without damaging the environment? And of course, now complying with this new, this newly defined international standards on ESG. So I just wanted to bring that uh, into the picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. I might ask Basuki if you have anything to add on this. I mean, um, you agree that there, there really isn't a tension, say, perhaps between you know, the need to reduce emissions and the need for ongoing um, economic development? I guess if you compare Southeast Asia with, say, China and India, who've taken very, very bold steps in doubling down on renewables and the puzzle for me really is, you know, I mean, Southeast Asia has all the potential to really invest in renewables, uh, uh, to talk about industrial policy, to, to rally and mobilize uh, efforts uh, to move away from coal. And coal still accounts for, on average, 70, 75% of the energy mix in all of these countries. Not to say that coal still remains dominant in China and India. But in terms of solar, uh, for example, uh, both these countries have, have managed to drive the cost down. And there's very good steps being taken in integrating solar into the fuel mix. Now, can Southeast Asia do the same? I, I would argue you know, Indonesia should be in the lead in doubling down on renewables, really build, integrating this into the national development plan. This is not a defensive strategy. I would argue that renewables actually can be a driver of, of economic growth uh, for, for many of these larger economies. Uh, and linked with this, I think, uh, to what Tisa said on building uh, climate resilience. Uh, again, here, I mean, I think Southeast Asia, if South Asia is really prone to rising ground temperatures. Uh, the primary risk for Southeast Asia really is on uh, uh, devastating floods. So how do you build up that climate resilience while simultaneously changing your energy system? I would say that, you know, when we're talking about rebalancing, this should be in the mix. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that, Vasuki. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of, there are a lot of uh, challenges and it's, you couldn't say anything other than Southeast Asia is at the beginning, all, all countries in Southeast Asia are at the beginning of starting to think about these transitions and, and um, trying to start to try and do something about it. I mean, the question I suppose I'd like to put to all of you, is the difficult question is, how do you, where, do you, where do you start and how do you generate uh, momentum, particularly taking into account politics, taking into account um, the political economy of, of countries that are very much dependent on an industrialization-based model? Do you see any particular sort of green shoots or opportunities where, where there's opportunities to drive, drive, drive change and progress in the right direction. Trisha, I go, go to you maybe first. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question. Like, how do we incentivize ourselves to make the changes that are not necessarily politically palatable uh, or even demand-driven, right? So uh, our communities and society ourselves are not very well educated as to the needs to move into this new growth era. So we know that uh, politicians are ultimately incentivized by that. So I think that's a really crucial question that um, anyone who is in this field needs to ask ourselves. Um, and once we have that answer, you know, place that pressure on the necessary governments as well as uh, regional institutions of the day. So including your ASEAN, uh, your, you know, your World Bank, other sorts of development institutions that exist, that do exist in our country. I think one answer that I have gotten recently from our own research in this area is that um, it ultimately does start from pressure from abroad. So this is something that I know can be a little bit of a, of a sensitive uh, subject because we like to believe that reforms come from within, um, that domestic reforms start first, and so on. However, in my experience uh, in the country that I know best, again in Malaysia, I'll give you two examples. So number one, Malaysia has recently signed and ratified the CPTPP, uh, which is the new iteration of the former TPPA. Um, and so some of the major chapters in this CPTPP document actually include uh, standards that need to be met by the Malaysian government on environment, number one, 
which we've been talking a lot about. Number two, labor. So it requires us to sign or amend our laws in order to comply with the international ILO standards, uh, for example. Number three, in the area of um, government procurement. So Malaysia also has a lot of controversial and uh, you know, sensitive procurement policies that are um, meant to protect a certain segment of our community as well as number four, state-owned enterprises. So state-owned enterprises or government-linked companies, um, they loom large uh, in not just Malaysia, but I think many of our Southeast Asian economies have a large presence of, gov of government within the economy. So again, taking a page out of international agreements and seeing how we can use them to reform from within. So I think that's one possible driver. It may not apply to all economies. I think some, it, it really depends on how it is um, each of the economies want to respond to it, but that's one method. Uh, the other thing is to look at, you know, ultimately international investors. So what kinds of standards are international investors, especially international institutional invest investors are looking at? Um, if they're coming from countries that they themselves need to comply with very high standards. They will set the same standards for the investee companies that they're looking at in Southeast Asia. And this is where um, the, it, it, it's a, it is about a business. So it's a little bit of a cynical reason uh, because you can't do business unless you comply with these environments. But this is really how people operate without the laws, without the regulations in place nothing is going to compel them to do better. So I think we should take advantage of all of these instruments and, and tools at hand um, and do what we can with them, while at the same time, educating our public, educating our young to um, really transform ourselves. And once we get onto this new growth trajectory and what that means, then ho hopefully it's a sort of holistic environment within which we operate. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. I might ask Basuki and Teza if you have anything else that you'd want to add or where, how do you get momentum on, on these issues? But also, um, Trisha has brought up the issue of how does climate change affect, the international, affect Southeast Asia's international relations and external relations with other, with other, other partners? And so you know, we've got things like you know, the carbon border adjustment mechanism in, in the EU uh, for example, a lot of talk around, you know, ca carbon finance and financing just transitions and so on. So I put sort of two questions for either of you to sort of to talk about in terms of opportunities to drive change, but also this international element. Yeah, I can start uh, and I can talk about the carbon uh, issues as well. But I wanted to start by um, saying that in answer to your question of where do we start, I think we should start with um, forgetting efficiency and scale as a mantra for economic development um, and instead focus on what is um, providing well-being uh, to the environment and to 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 society and I know this might be you know some might sound radical but uh, you know in the in the context of planetary boundaries efficiency and scale has in fact been wasteful and harmful right so if we are to focus on what actually delivers what we need as a society, as an um, as a you know, as a planetary society, then we should think beyond efficiency and scale. We should think of what actually delivers well-being. Um, and um, in the way to do that, uh, uh, without being arbitrary, right? Without being, without cherry picking. Oh, this industry gets to survive. That industry doesn't get to survive. The way to do that without being arbitrary is uh, two things. Number one is uh, to get the pricing right, to drive in the externality factors and costs into every single um, price. So we're talking here about maybe carbon pricing, um, and that alludes to your question about you know, carbon uh, border adjustment mechanisms and other types of, actually the entire world now is thinking about carbon pricing. The IMF has come up with carbon pricing for, uh, um, you know, uh, suggested carbon prices uh, set at uh, you know $75 for uh, industrialized countries, $50, $50 per ton for um, emerging economies and 25 for vulnerable societies, uh, vulnerable countries. 
um, with the idea that every single country should have its own carbon pricing system. And that will affect international relations, that will affect trade. Um, but if the global community comes together and if ASEAN decides as well as a, as a region, how it is best positioned to set its carbon price, um, then, uh, you know, you know, ASEAN would be in a good position to negotiate with other countries um, because that's coming. You know, that that discussion is coming sooner or later, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, the second um, thing is uh, I'm alluding to uh, ESG that Trisha mentioned, um, and all of the innovations around the financial sector, uh, ESG being one of those innovations, um, but right now, I think that ESG is being treated as an add-on by investors and bankers uh, as a, oh, a portfolio that exists outside of its overall portfolio. If you're interested in green stuff, this is where you would invest. We have a portfolio for that. But it doesn't really address the core um, or fundamental architecture of the financial sector. And I think in order to address that, we need to factor in climate risks. Um, and because climate risks are now quantifiable, you know, if we're getting floods five times a year and Europe is getting forest fires, you know, twice a year, then that is a very physical, quantifiable climate risk. And if there are certain industries that are contributing to those climate risks, then they shouldn't get a great credit rating. And if we integrate climate risk into financial sector assessments, all of these industries would not get triple A ratings. And we would not be able to get financing for those companies um, at such a low rate. Um, and that, that is what I think. We start there, correct carbon pricing, integrate climate risks. I think we can transform the system from inside. Thank you, Tisa. Vasu, can I give, give you a chance to say something on, on, this, on this question, the getting momentum going and, and the international sort of elements? Yeah, you know, uh, I spend a lot of time at the IMF, so I'm about to say that uh, you know, global rules uh, set by multilateral organizations have a role. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, when it comes to climate, I think the best policies originate at home. The best policies built on domestic political support in, in, in the government's ability to rally its population, that this is a significant risk uh, for the country. And, and so that therefore there, there needs to be resolute policy steps taken. Now, the private sector, certainly, you know, international banks, uh, institutional investors, in the kind of uh, uh, capital flows that they deploy in Southeast Asia, will require uh, the investing companies to comply with ESG standards. And I, I think on the private sector space, I'm a little bit more optimistic that standards, overall standards, are going to be lifted worldwide, including in Southeast Asia. But I think when you look at the entire multilateral space for climate negotiations, uh, that is a mess. Uh, uh, you know, this entire debate on climate space, uh, on, on, on providing developing countries with a little bit more time in, in uh, decarbonizing. Uh, but we've seen in this Russia-Ukraine context that Europe is likely to delay its own decarbonization plan, which had originally set an intermediate target for 2030 mainly because of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So I would say the best policies start at home. And if you, if you look back uh, 40, 50 years, uh, if, if the debate in Southeast Asia in the late 1960s was what would be your new development model, I think Southeast Asian countries pretty much figured out on their own that it was going to be exports and investment. Uh, so I would you know, really focus a lot of attention in domestic political resilience in getting this done. Uh, th thanks for that, uh, Vasuki. I think we could actually keep going with this line of topics for quite a long time, but I want to go back to what, Vasuki, you put on the table in, in your opening remarks about um, globalization and this having been the engine for Southeast Asia's economies in the, over the previous decades, and then now the question marks uh, over the future of that, and that's driven, of course, by, in part by geopolitics between the United States and China, in part around some of the concerns around resilience that have been revealed by COVID-19 as well as uh, by Ukraine, and indeed concerns related to, to the, the cl climate impacts as well associated with uh, the industrialization-based model. 
but focusing on you know what's the ability of Southeast Asian economies really to continue to benefit from globalization and use that as a driver of, of future economic development. I mean, right now they're trying to navigate between the United States and China, trying to maintain access between the two. Is that a viable strategy? Um, what's its limits? Um, Basuki, maybe I, I could put that to you and, and, and then go to the others. Now, if you look at the, if you look at what the geopolitical experts are saying, uh, uh, what they're essentially saying is uh, this is going to be a protracted uh, long-term battle for regional and global supremacy between the U.S. and China. Uh, steps taken by the U.S. over the last few years, particularly with active participation of many Southeast Asian countries, I mean, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, I think, is a classic example where uh, the U.S. and its allies are trying to build this parallel set of standards on, for example, on digital, uh, uh, in, in, and essentially conditioning all of this, uh, that there will be money available for climate infrastructure development. Uh, but you know, so decoupling really is a reality uh, at the moment. I think for the near term, Southeast Asia is going to benefit from the fact that a lot of uh, multinational companies are looking at Vietnam and other countries uh, to move away from China, which has been the final assembly point uh, for regional supply chains for the last three decades. Uh, but that decoupling process is going to take a little bit of time. Uh, so, you know, this is the space, this is the time, I think, for Southeast Asia to reflect on, there could be near-term benefits uh, from uh, manufacturing coming into the region, but the way the geopolitical terms are being set, it is increasingly like, likely that we're going to be in this parallel world of a uh, Sinosphere, a China-dominated uh, economic space and a US-dominated economic space. That may imply uh, 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 lower economic growth. That may imply you know, uh, less investment flows. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia may well realize that aligning with IPEF uh, may, may generate uh, windfall investment flows, right? So and that needs to be established. A little bit more work needs to be done on that. So this is the time really to look also at domestic drivers uh, because, you know, the ge geopolitical reality is going to be there for the next few decades. Uh, this is the time for Southeast Asia to shift gears. Mm. Thank you, Pasuki. I might, I might go to, to Trisha next if you have any thoughts on this question response to and response to Vasuki um, and his and his uh, comments but also in particular this one of Vasuki your key points is to, to focus more on domestic demand as a driver of, of, of the region's economies in the future Tr Trisha what are your thoughts on all of these points um, yeah so thank you I think I respond first to that point about how um, yes, while well, multilateral standards are important, I mean, ultimately, it is about domestic political reforms. Um, I would love to agree with that. And I do think that that would be ideal. So that would be the highest standard. Um, however, there are exceptions where there is, you know, no potential opportunity for such domestic political reform. And then what do we do then? We can't just wait. So I think they have to happen simultaneously. Um, so you know, in Malaysia, for example, domestic political reform is still at large, uh, one would say. Uh, in fact, we're having our elections soon and the last few years has seen the country going through a particularly um, unusual and unprecedented period of political instability. So to expect the reforms to come from within at this point in time um, is actually quite unrealistic. But moving over to the question of geopolitics and US and China, um, you know, even before uh, the most recent trends of the tech decoupling, I think there were already a lot of questions about how Southeast Asia is benefiting from the US-China trade war. So you're talking about uh, research and analysis that you know would have been done about three to four years ago. Um, and I do remember reading a paper uh, by, the uh, by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies saying that selected economies in Southeast Asia have benefited from the US-China trade war but not all. So, uh, you know, countries, economies like Vietnam have benefited, but not actually economies like Malaysia. 
uh, which you know we would expect to have been able to take advantage of that that trade war. Unfortunately, at that point in time, it did not yet happen. Um, but I do agree that we are actually well placed. So all Southeast Asian economies are well placed to be able to take advantage of this decoupling. However, um, the the ongoing and I predict increasing tensions between both US and China will actually also, um, number one, provide challenges to our economies. I think our economies are actually quite well integrated already. Uh, a country like Malaysia, we are a small open trading nation. We have strong trading relationships with both US and China. Uh, but on the other hand, countries like ours have also historically been very open to dialogue and communication with both. Um, a country like Malaysia has never really stuck its neck out to favor one side over the other. So it will be interesting to see how it is that it maintains both the relationships with uh, both of these superpowers um, in the future. So just a last word on the, the IPEF. Um, I think that's certainly an interesting development. I think some parts of the IPEF are going to have uh, some regulatory standards to be met and some others not. Um, but if you look at, again, I go back to the CPTPP, it's also interesting that China has put its bid forward to want to sign and ratify the agreement that originated in the US in the first place. So China has also taken advantage of this agreement that has already you know, many economies, 10 and more, uh, joining it. Uh, so just pitting these two really large multilateral agreements with each other um, and it will be interesting to see, you know, where this takes all of the other economies in the future. Uh, just a, a final word about digitalization. Um, I think one of the questions was whether, you know, we see digitalization as, uh, as an opportunity or a threat moving forward. I think it certainly can and it should be seen as an opportunity just given the fact that COVID-19 has seen digital trade soar um, in ways that never before happened. And Southeast Asian economies really, again, we are well placed to take advantage of this digital leap. However, we do need to be very cognizant of uh, issues like number one, data privacy, uh, number two, the digital divide, which evidently happens in economies which are still very much developing. Um, you know, during the pandemic, there was a big news item in Malaysia where a young girl had to climb up a tree in order to access Wi-Fi to get to her school. Um, so these stories are, are, are very rampant in, in our economies. And I think that's just, while, while we are thinking about the digital wave, we need to think about the realities on the ground as well. Thank you. No, thank you, Trisha. And, and finally, just come to, to Teaser. How do you see these issues around US-China geopolitics and deglobalization, disruption to supply chains, how do you see that affecting where you think the Southeast Asian nations need to go? I think globalization or now the trend towards deglobalization is affected and impacted by politics more than the economic um, factors. Uh, and uh, I would always want to ask back, you know, take a step back and ask again to ourselves, what do we want out of globalization? Because at the beginning at the outset is that we want globalization to deliver decentralized welfare and resources, essentially, right? We want resources to be spread out more evenly across the globe. Um, but because of the way that they've been negotiated um, and various political factors in play, instead production is centralized. Uh, it's not uh, as centralized at the source of the natural capital necessarily, nor at the source of the innovation or, you know, not, not at the source of the local wisdom. Um, Vesuki alluded to local solutions being the best solution. There are lots of local wisdom solutions for climate change. Not necessarily they uh, get to become, you know, on top, the, the top of the economic uh, global supply chain. But instead, production is centralized at the source of capital, the wealth owners. And this results in many trade practices that exacerbate environmental health and uh, local resilience. And the, all this is nothing new. I mean, there's a wealth of research and anecdotes and debates about this since, since GATT. 
Um, but you know, we, we need to always remember that if an ecosystem is designed to produce fish for 1 million people and is forced to produce for 1 billion people across the globe, there will be problems. So I think if we hark back to the ecosystem limits, uh, then uh, we need to rethink how globalization is, is, um, is managed. And if I would just like to add, because there, there was a there was a point about digitalization, and I think that is a promising um, um, update to globalization, because knowledge is a resource with unlimited tradability and mobility. Um, knowledge to uh, produce things and knowledge to innovate and knowledge to create things are now being spread and disseminated at a much faster rate and reaching more and more people, uh, even in isolated places. I mean, if you spend enough time on YouTube, like I do, <laughs> there is a wealth of practical business making skills from, I don't know, embroidery to making robots. So, I mean, I think commodity trade can be less of a focus in the future of globalization. Um, there's less need for centralized production systems if the knowledge to produce is spread out, decentralized and democratized, and um, people will get creative with limited resources. You know, uh, innovation will explode, I think. Thank you, Tiza. I mean, certainly, um, digital growth and consumption of digital services hopefully uh, poses less of a burden on the on the environment. So if we can all just do more of that and spend more time online, I'm not sure how good it is for our mental health, but um, unless you're watching Lowy Institute panel discussions, um, <laughs> but, uh, at least it'll be better uh, for the environment, uh, perhaps. We're, we are starting to run out of uh, allocated time, but I do want to ask one quick, uh, maybe lightning round style question. You know, we started this conversation by noting that, of course, all the nations within Southeast Asia are, are very different. There are questions about, you know, what is the model, what is the commonality, and so on. Another related question then is, is what is the role of, of ASEAN? Not, and I'm perhaps less interested in the, in the organization itself of ASEAN, but rather what is the relationship between Southeast Asian nations as a, as a group, as a block, and what could be done with this? Where is this? Headed. So I'd like to put it to, to each of you your, as your final sort of comments. Where would you hope that the region can go in the future as a group in order to, to deliver the changes that you think it requires? Maybe if we can start with you, uh, Basuki. I would say three areas since it's a lightning round. Let me boil this down to ASEAN should be more on financial integration. This has been an objective for many, many years where it's actually not delivered tangible economic benefits in integrating financial systems of the region, uh, certainly on climate finance and, and on climate resilience. I mean, the ASEAN economic community is a wonderful uh, uh, objective, but we're seeing very little evidence of how that is going to work in terms of climate change. And the final point is on digitalization, where I think there's a profound tension between command and control between uh, many countries in Southeast Asia thinking that the China, the great firewall model of uh, digital controls and surveillance is the best way, whereas actually a deep, more decentralized model and the ability to deliver e-governance actually is going to, going to benefit not only citizens, but overall is going to improve the efficiency of these economies. So if ASEAN is able to knock its heads together on these three areas uh, as priorities, I think we're going to go a long way on, on this rebalancing issue uh, for the next decade. Yeah. Thank you, Rasuki. Uh, Trisha, maybe we go to you next. All right, thank you. Um, so we actually do this annual report on ASEAN integration every year, uh, looking at how well the Southeast Asian economies are being integrated as envisioned in the original you know, ASEAN Economic Community document. Um, envisioning integration by 2025. So in short, we're not very well integrated yet, uh, as Basuki pointed out. So I think just taking um, a leave from him, I think I also will focus on these three areas. Um, so I would like to see greater integration, not at ASEAN level, don't have it necessarily dictated by the bureaucracy of ASEAN Secretariat, but as Southeast Asian dynamic economies as we are, um, number one, Again, going back to economics and trade, uh, we already trade a lot with each other, but I think with digital trade coming in, there are a lot of opportunities there for the region. If the region can get its act together in, for example, harmonizing its digital standards, I think that's really great opportunity 
um, for us to pitch as a region to other regions and other businesses from abroad. So that's one. Uh, number two, I think going back to, again, like standards of human rights. So um, ASEAN has a sort of human rights declaration, but I think linking it to business and human rights, if we also have some kind of standards uh, that would really help each of our economies to progress better, to be more visible internationally, uh, maybe even compliance with other standards like the EU and so on. And this also, again, goes back to the first point in increasing um, uh, trade and digital trade. And finally, I think people-to-people -people integration. Um, this is less talked about. There's a report that we've also done on migration within the region. Um, you know, why not think outside the box and think about not having passports within the region? Is that something that we can ever envision to happen? Uh, because that would actually really help in terms of business travel and, and ensuring that there's some kind of harmonization and community that's created in a more organic manner. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Tricia. And finally, uh, Tisa, for the, for the final word. I think the three areas where Southeast Asia could do a lot of transformative work on um, is number one, rethinking the primary indicator for growth, the primary goal for growth. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of countries, a few, not a lot, <laughs> a few countries now toying with the idea that GDP should not be the main indicator for growth. There's New Zealand, there's Bhutan. I think that could be an interesting discussion to be held at the Southeast Asian uh, level where we could then start talking about better indicators like climate resilience, like well-being um, and you know, uh, equality. Um, and then number two, uh, Southeast Asia uh, could also, uh, needs to also urge, well, it's already being discussed, carbon pricing has already been being discussed, but it needs to be in a more coordinated fashion and with a regional view instead of, I think, the current more domestic view of carbon pricing, um, placing itself as uh, a future giant uh, region uh, for uh, carbon pricing, uh, uh, you know, equal to the, the European uh, region, equal to um, uh, the, the East Asian region. Um, just start thinking more, you know, regionally, regionally on that uh, perspective. Uh, and number three is, uh, Harking back to my earlier point on climate risk integration uh, and what uh, Tricia said on, on standards, financial standards, that's an important discussion to be had. It's not just about what um, Southeast Asia can do as a green uh, finance hub or as a, as, a, as a destination for green investment, but also how Southeast Asia can position itself in the negotiations and discussions on the global financial architecture and what could be done to transform the global financial architecture to include climate risk, to be, you know, to, to provide more benefits for uh, emerging economies and vulnerable communities in Southeast Asia. Thank you, uh, Tisa. And I think we're coming to the end of our allocated uh, time. So thank you to all three of you for, you know, what's been a really fascinating discussion. I found it even more interesting, I think, than even the all the written contributions that we've had so far. So. Um, Thanks to all three of you uh, for today. Um, thanks to our audience as well for joining us for this discussion of Southeast Asia, Asia's future prospects. If you haven't already, please check out the online debate series where you can find the articles by our panelists as well as several other leading thinkers from the region. And a special thanks, of course, again, uh, to our panelists, uh, Vasuki, Tricia, and Teaser.